Kicking It, a true tale of the Rockettes and a stray witch. Every once in a while, if I look back on my long and winding career in what is commonly known as showbiz, I find myself panning for golden moments. And not unlike the pot-bellied old quarterback reliving that perfect play of the homecoming game, I like to recall this absolutely perfect golden moment, roll it around in my mind a little, and watch it gleam. It's New York City, 1987. I'm playing Maleficent, Mistress of All Evil, in the Disney Summer Spectacular at Radio City Music Hall. A rottenly written theme park transplant spilling over with every conceivable Disney character ever invented or stolen, all played by terrific singer-dancers, a few kid actors, me, and the one and only Radio City Music Hall Rockettes. All of us mushed into a manic 45-minute review, 21 shows a week, like vaudeville. Return to Oz is the movie they run along with our show, that dazzler of a Disney flick that opens with little Dorothy getting electroshock treatment. Appalled mothers with wailing children flee from the theater in waves. I take it upon myself to write to Michael Eisner. I implore him to pull this horror trip, to put in something tried and true, something gentle and beautiful like Dumbo or Pinocchio or Cinderella, but oddly, he doesn't respond. Now, Radio City resents the hell out of Disney because Disney's relentlessly breathing down their necks like Radio City has no idea how to put on a show. The singer-dancers resent the hell out of Disney because they're busting their butts in used, smelly, hyper-hot, hyper-heavy animal costumes and blowing their teensy paychecks at the chiropractors. The Rockettes resent the hell out of Disney because they're forced to wear mutant eight-foot broom costumes in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. You never heard such curse words coming out of a broom. And me... I resent the hell out of Disney because it has been mandated that I must be green. Yes, in some stupid stone manual, it had been carved, all evil witches must be green. No matter that the movie Maleficent morphs through many an ivory skin tone, no matter that I can't ever seem to get all the green off, so even when I'm not green, I look ill, no matter that I'm the only person trapped at the theater in between all 21 shows while all my friends get to go out to play, while I'm left pacing back and forth like a crazed, caged animal, Animal smoking 6,427 cigarettes, and no matter that the rest of my get-up already so does the trick. I mean, in the show, I enter, rising from below the stage, evilly laughing, pretty pathetically, I might add, but there's thunder, there's lightning, there's a big pyrotechnic thing. I got the big black horns, I got the big fuchsia Elvis collar attached to a black bodysuit, I got the over-the-elbow green evening gloves with three-inch red nails on them, I got the massive black velvet cape heavy as a fire curtain, and... I also just happen to be wearing a nine-foot-high motorized black velvet skirt driven expertly by a great guy named Nick. Well, expertly, except for the rare but interesting occasions when he falls asleep. Nicky and I, understandably, bond. But really, the green face has just so gotta go. Now, one of the more angelic characters of the summer, Ken, happens to work for the other side. Ah, life is never simply good or evil, black or white, green or flesh tone, is it? Anyway, Ken was the company manager, the liaison guy, the bridge between these two warring American institutions, and as such, he's inscrutable. But Ken's been a Broadway stage manager for most of his life, so he definitely gets what needs to be got, and he nobly, steadily goes to bat for me, eventually eroding the theretofore unalterable green witch policy. Yes, I do believe that it's just as I begin to crack from cabin fever and on a dare go, in full green face, to the Clinique counter at Saks Fifth Avenue to buy moisturizer, that Ken brings me news of my freedom from green, my freedom to join my pals at 
at the Woolworths lunch counter in between shows for chocolate cake, chocolate sundaes, and 6,247 cigarettes. Now, Disney happens to have this other written-in-stone policy that I laugh at and mildly ponder the effects of, but don't mind much, and that's this. Evil characters don't get curtain calls. Mice, dogs, ducks, humans, yes, witches, no. Okay, whatever, fine. So, at the end of every show, every day of that 21-show week, during every curtain call finale, I climb down the ladder from my skirt, I hang out with Nikki and the crew guys, and watching from the wings, I try never to miss the one truly sensational thrill of the show. The vast Radio City Music Hall Orchestra climbs a few tantalizing keys, fantastically breaks into an org orgasmically Broadwayized version of okay zippity doo da, but in all their silver sequined turquoise velvet silver tap shoed glory, in the undisputed mother of all kick lines, those rockets rise majestically up out of the floor and rise and kick and rise and kick and well, yeah. I usually tear up a little, and somehow I can't help but begin to dream that maybe someday, somehow, maybe I could, nah, but, aw, gee, maybe just once, just one show, wouldn't it be swell if I could, nah, everybody just say no, and it's too conceited to ask for, nah, but it sure is nice to dream anyway waiting in the wings. I then get a small but significant gift from the gods, which comes, as they so often do, disguised as a slap in the face. Never, especially if you're afraid to want too much or to aim too big, never underestimate the motivational value of a direct insult. The perfectly moronic bearer of this divine little awakening has the distinction of being one of the first truly monumental cement heads of my career. The program says he's our producer, but he's Disney quality control, all right, in his powder blue leisure suits and shiny print shirts and huge tinted aviator glasses and sprayed comb over. He shows up to cluelessly, pointlessly mess with all elements of the show, to give performance notes with his astonishing artistic acumen, and to leave in his ignorant, toxic wake a sea of furiously cursing crew guys and singer-dancers and five suicidal stage managers. I'll call him Derwin. Derwin is a poisonous pimple on the otherwise happy tushy of our planet. Now, Between his last visit and this one, I've been given three tiny new lines of dialogue that have been handed all the way down through the Disney approval hierarchy to Ken and then to me. So, of course, I've been saying them. Derwin comes up to me after the show, and he says, Those lines you said, have you been drinking? Are you drunk? Well, I'm so shocked and so furious that, of course, I laugh. And then I explain, reasonably, politely. Oh, sure, please. Of course I would have loved to have done the movie version. Slowly I turn and I say, how I get through 21 shows a week of this warmed-over pureed crap without drinking is a bloody miracle, pal. And you should get down on your combed-over powder-blue knees and kiss my... But no, no. I ingest the inanity. I was bred to be too polite, but fear not. Because this time, my system, instead of taking the usual rageful nap, converts this poison into fuel. To turn a wisp of a daydream into a deliciously wicked scheme, like every good witch oughta. Policy could go straight to hell. I was going to kick policy's butt, but good. And I was going to be wearing a pair of silver tap shoes to kick it with. So I lay out my plan to Nick. On the very, very, very last show, 
when all the Disney brass is out there watching, ha ha, I would take my incredibly well-deserved 21-show-a-week evil character forbidden curtain call thank you, and I would put an exclamation point on the end of that sentence by kicking in the center of the line with the actual historical Radio City Music Hall Rockettes. Nick is ecstatic. He figures they'll dock my pay, which scares the hell out of me, but he tells me not to worry. He says if they do, the crew guys will chip in and pay my salary themselves. But he tells me now what I really need to do is go to the head rocket lady and ask her permission. Oh, such a quiet, old-fashioned lady of a lady she was, who used to be a rocket herself, of course, and who has had such a wearying summer so far. I knock on her office door. She's sitting at her desk. I almost curtsy. I tell her my wish. Her mouth curls up at the corners a little. She asks me how. What would I look like? How would it work? So I tell her. Bottom half, I'm a rockette. Flesh-toned stockings, silver tap shoes. Top half, I'm Maleficent. Elvis-collared black bodysuit, long-nailed evening gloves, big black horns. And it'd go like this. It's the end of curtain call, see? All the characters have taken their bows. Then right after Mickey comes running out of the Disney castle arch taking his now penultimate bow, the orchestra climbs that one tantalizing key just before zippity doo da, and then I'd appear in the castle archway. I'd work that arch to the right, I'd work that arch to the left, then I'd walk on forward downstage, join fluidly with the rockets as they rise from the floor, kicking and rising, kicking and rising along with them, then rocket goodbye wave, curtain down. The head rocket lady smiles softly and moves the stapler from one pile of paper to the other. And great lady that she is, she's only worried they'll dock my pay. I tell her it doesn't matter, and I almost believe it. And then she gives me a nod and a smile, and she sends me to ask the gals, but she says I must be sure to go to the dressing room on the left, which housed the core rockets, the alpha rockets. Well, I knock on that door to the left, and as I open it, an old MGM movie springs to life. I step into a dressing room full of sequins and cigarette smoke and raucous laughter, and I respectfully propose my evil scheme to these all-time great dames, and they laugh and they scream, yeah! instantly, and they decide that Jeannie, the tallest rockette, the one in the center, would teach me the tricks of the trade. One last hoop to go around or through, though. I so didn't want Ken to get called on the carpet by Disney after he'd been my hero. Do I tell him? Do I not? Do I tell him? Do I not? I tear my hair. I take my chances. I go to his office. I confess my dream. I tell how it'll all go down. I wait for the verdict. He listens. Not one single muscle moving in his face. And he says right away, like I'd asked him the time. What I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about. Goodbye. And I'm off like a shot to buy tights and tap shoes. Those in the know agree not to tell the singer-dancers we want no chance of a leak. Now, Jeannie the Rockette has the patience of Job as I make her rehearse with me 7,246 million times. Not that there's so much to learn, but there's this, this weird little backstep cross up into the kick thing that if the right was where the left ought to be or the left was where the right ought to be, well, it's what would either springboard me into perfect synchrony with the most famous synchronized kick line in the whole of history or what could lead to... Sure, almost unfathomable disaster. I lie in bed at night in the grinding jaws of the obsessive anxiety monster. I am going to be the only person who isn't a star to ever kick in the center of the line with the actual historical Radio City Music Hall Rockettes and without a group rehearsal. And every once in a while, I'm still screwing up the weird little back step. I keep seeing the headline over and over. Stupid idiot klutz pulls down entire line of the legendary Rockettes for the first time in the history of Radio City.
Sure, there would be sprained ankles, torn ligaments, dislocated discs, endless concussions, and yes, of course, a death. We were, after all, on a stage that was continuing to rise as we were kicking. I could hear the innocent skull crack. I could see the bloody sequined turquoise velvet white plumed bellboy cap flying slow-mo into the blackness of the orchestra pit. Dream shmeem, what was I thinking? Well, time taps inexorably on, and it's the very, very last day, and then the very, very last show. So, instead of my usual black tights and pink checkered high-top sneakers, I've got on the flesh tone tights and the silver tap shoes. I rush down to the basement, quietly tap, 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 tapping. I climb up the ladder and get into my skirt without anybody seeing me, and there I sit, all alone, in the bowels of Radio City Music Hall, praying. The show goes almost entirely smoothly, except for one exceptionally alarming hiccup. Because of the taps, I slip inside my skirt, kick Nick in the head, and almost fall in on top of him. But unfazed, Nicky tells him now frantically apologizing, completely freaking out me. Susie, Susie, don't worry about it. Don't you see? You can't slip now. You already got it out of the way. Good old Saint Nick. But it's time. It's now. It's curtain call. Definitely not as usual. I am behind the Disney castle on one side of the archway. My singer-dancer buddies in their character costumes are on the other side of the archway, waiting to take their very last bows. That big, beautiful shaft of soft white light from the stage shining onto the floor between us. For all they know, it's the last show, so I'm just there to say goodbye. Oh, we're all blowing kisses and yelling, I love you! I love you! You're the best! And thank God, only the guy who plays Goofy thinks to ask, and only on his way through the archway onto the stage, wait, why are you wearing those shoes? And Donald ducks out after him, leaving me all alone with Mickey Mouse. Now, maybe it was because the dancer who played Mickey never spoke while she was in costume. I don't know. But somehow, in that moment, I I feel as if I'm suddenly sucked up onto this higher vibrational plateau. And I'm looking over at the original, old-fashioned Mickey Mouse. And as he's looking over at me, he slumps so sadly and he wipes away a tear, and he puts both his hands to his heart and then out to me, and then, with a wave goodbye and a leap into the light, he's gone. And just as I can feel my heart break clean in two, I hear, Susie! And I'm in that great old MGM movie again, and there's Jeannie waving and screaming at me from the wings, I'll see you out there, Susie! You're gonna be great! And just as I'm wondering how the hell she's going to make it back into the line on time, I hear my cue. It's that key change climbing those tantalizing steps up. And I'm completely certain that I'm going to die. But I step out into that castle archway anyway. And my absolutely perfect golden moment begins. I am hit by... This surprisingly blazing, nearly truly blinding white light and this profound calm washes over me. And I work that arch to the left and I work that arch to the right. So what if I'm wearing big black horns? I'm a Ziegfeld girl. And there's this symphony of screams and laughter and, oh, my God, and applause and whistles from the wings and the stage and the catwalks. I can't even hear the audience. And I I walk or maybe float forward and I melt into line with those actual historical Radio City Music Hall rockets. And we kick and we kick and we kick and I am indeed one with the universe. And then we come to a beautiful, peaceful stasis. We do our rocket goodbye wave. The mighty Radio City curtain falls. And I am swarmed by screaming, weeping rockets. And I feel just like Miss America. 
Turns out that the white light had been so very blinding because Nick had fixed it so that all of Radio City's 12 spotlights had been shining on me at once. Turns out they didn't dock my pay after all. I figured that must have been Ken again. And it also turns out that about a year later, Ken died of AIDS. And when I heard that he'd become an official angel, I thought of our conversation at the party on that last hilarious, victorious night. So, Ken, I say, tell me honestly, I mean, I know I had one of the most pathetic evil laughs on record. There had to be far better, far scarier evil laughers. And he says, yeah, yeah, there was. One woman in particular. But I didn't like her. And you know what? Life's too short. So, with my magnificent, maleficent morsel of pay dirt, ah, sure, there's a slight sliver of satisfaction that it was also maybe a little bit of grit in the eye of the group soul corporate creature, sure. But now, what shines through as the authentic, eternal gold of the piece is that rare heavenly harmony of comedy, music, and a choir of huge-hearted people, a loving, electrifying touch of the mother load that always seems beyond our grasp, but is, in truth, always right within our reach. And I remind myself that every once in a true blue moon, that, too, is showbiz. <laughs>